Hello and good evening everybody, good to see so many of you joining us here again this evening, you're very very welcome back to everybody out there, just did a quick sound check guys, I already did it, make sure everyone can hear me loud and clear, I am Mohammed, Suzanne, uh, Philip, Haley, Nikki Hayes are there, Johnny, how are you Darren Clayton? Indeed, coming through loud and clear, everybody doesn't seem to be any issues there, as I said. Okay, guys, that's great. Like I said, for anyone who's joining us late, just to let you know as well that uh, your toolkit notes, your summary notes, webinar slides for this lesson are available now on your student login area for anybody that purchased our toolkits. They are there for you as well, so they will help you with today's lesson too. Now, before we get on with today's lesson, just a quick recap on lesson one. We, of course, had our brief introduction to graphic design, what it is, what it isn't, more to the point. We looked at the different areas of design, and then we had a little Adobe overview of the applications we will be using later on in this course, which, of course, are Photoshop, Illustrator, and then finally InDesign as well in lesson 10. Then we looked at our introduction to Photoshop and of course it's use of layers as well, it's use of layers. Okay, so don't forget to guys, a few people have been asking about this already there today. We will be giving away that very, very special lifetime membership to Shaw Academy live during lesson eight. Live during lesson eight. And don't worry, all you have to do is attend four live lessons before lesson eight. And as I said, some people were commenting that in their student area, it recorded that they didn't attend. Don't worry, guys, that's a different system. Okay, we're updating our website at the moment, actually. But your attendance is recorded, guys. So don't worry about that if you see that message. Okay. And then finally again, oh, just a quick toolkit update for you as well. If you check that uh, in there too for anybody that purchased those, uh, there's also now a bonus video in there for you too, which I've put together for you. And it's basically digital painting in Photoshop. So what I've done is I've taught you how to digitally paint in sort of black and white images, which is quite a cool thing to do. And you can see this is the results that I achieved in that. You can be using your own images, and I hope you do use your own pictures. So we colored in our black and white image and colored it in then and colored it. Does it look good? I think it looks good. Awesome video, says Evelyn. Saw it earlier. Good stuff. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, looks amazing. But I thought you drew that yourself. I'm afraid not, Brett says. <laughs> okay. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, John is asking, can I buy the toolkit next week? Of course, John, you can buy it whenever you like. It's there throughout the, throughout the duration of the course. And of course, they're there for you then forever as well, John. Okay, so you can get them whenever you like as well. All right. But I do encourage you to get them sooner than later because the notes will help you as we progress through the lessons. Now, okie dokie, okie dokie. So lesson two. Now the purpose of today's lesson is to introduce you to the elements and principles of design. Now these are at the core of any type of design you do. And once you're familiar and aware of these and understand how to apply them to your own work, you will become a better designer. Because you'll basically be able to understand the difference between good and bad design and understand why. Understand why it is good or why it is bad. And once you sort of understand these fundamentals, as I said, whether you're amateurs or professionals alike, you can utilize them to create much more professional looking pieces. Now, just a few little sort of side notes. You know, these are not all hard, steadfast rules. You know, they're not written in stone. But, you know, and of course, rules are made to be broken. But we need to know what these rules are first as well, okay? Okay, so like I said, and we will be examining them in further detail as we progress through the course and of course in much more detail in our advanced lessons also. Now, some of the aspects may seem a little bit trivial as we progress through today's lesson, but trust me, yeah, you, you just don't want to be taking them for granted. And like I said, once you become familiar with them and learn how to use them, it will help you to emphasize your designs and emphasize, of course, the message that you're sending in your designs. So this is what we're going to go through today, everybody. This is what you will be learning today. Um, are we using Photoshop today? June Davis is asking. Not today, June, but in lesson three and lesson four, we will be examining Photoshop. Okay. <clears throat> Now, so lesson two, uh, so like I said, understanding graph design elements and principles, so line, shape, color, texture, mass, and space. Our principles then are alignment, balance, contrast, proximity, and repetition. We'll also have a little look at color theory. We'll be doing a lot more on color theory as we progress through the course as well. And then finally, we're going to learn how to apply these to your own designs as well. So just a quick one for you out there now too. Many people are familiar already with our graphic design elements and principles 
principles. Just give us a quick yes or no if you're already familiar with them. Just, got, just out of curiosity for myself. Philip says yes, yes. Okay, a few yeses, but the majority uh, of no's are sort of vaguely. Okay. Well, like I said, guys, we'll go through them now in detail today. Our elements. Okay, in graphic design, there are key elements that enable us to communicate our message clearly. Okay. I think of them as ingredients, okay? These are the ingredients. When we talk about our principles then, this is like the recipe. So our elements are what we use as well. So we're gonna go through them in detail now, one by one. We'll probably spend more time today on our elements. We'll quickly go through our principles then at the end of the class because we will be coming back to our principles in a little bit more detail in future lessons too. So I'll just introduce them to you today. And as I said, we will be re-examining them as we progress through the course. As you can see, there are a little disclaimer. There have been some disagreements about the exact number of elements, but to be honest, I think these are the main conceptual ones that we need to worry about for now, okay? So we'll go through line first. Hopefully we all know what a line is, of course, but we need to understand what they represent also as well. So obviously it's one of the most important elements in design because it defines a subject's shape. But have you ever stopped to think about what it actually represents or even the mood associated with a particular type of line? I mean, of course, they can be thick or thin, they can be smooth or jagged, they can go in every direction. And of course, finally then, a very important point to remember is that lines can be either literal or implied. So it doesn't need to be, you know, a solid line. We can also imply lines as, as we, with our design as well, okay? So we're going to look first at our line types. So we have four basic types of line that we use as designers. And there are several dips of different types of lines defined by their use. First of all, we have contour lines. And anybody that's ever looked at a map or something like that will understand what contour lines are. And these are used to define edges. They create boundaries around or inside an object. And most lines you encounter in design generally tend to be contour lines. When we talk about dividing lines then, Dividing lines, these also define edges, but, but, they, but they divide lines by space. They actually, they're not solid lines, they actually use space to divide elements. And these are what we call dividing lines. Just like you can see on the screens in front of you would be, for example, the, the empty space between paragraphs of text, okay? Finally, then, or sorry, the th thirdly then, is our decoration lines. Actually, does anybody know what this type of decoration line is? Anybody, any idea what to, to, uh, that you see in the screens in front of you? Hatchings, who's on Philip is very quick through there. Yeah, it is indeed. This is cross hatching or hatching. So this is an example of using decoration lines, basically to add shading or form to an object. Okay. Finally then, gesture lines. These are generally sort of quick or rough continuous lines used to capture sort of form and movement. You see them used a lot in things like cartoons and those, uh, th that side of design as well. But like I said, generally quick lines, gesture lines, just to give a sense of movement to your designs as well. We don't generally tend to use them too often, but just to make you aware of them. Okay, so these are our line types. So, the next thing then is our line meanings, because there are lots of ways to describe a given line and each one has its own characteristic as well. So we need to understand as designers, what do these characteristics mean and what do they communicate? So let's take a look. The first one we look at are thin lines, pretty straightforward. Uh, Mubasa is just asking a quick question there, what is lorem ipsum? Oh, you would have seen it on my previous slide there. Lorem ipsum is basically what we call dummy text. It's basically Latin-based text that designers sometimes use uh, when they're designing if they don't have the original text to hand. So they're just basically, because it reads, it looks the same as regular text. It is basically dummy filler text that we use as designers, okay, before we replace it with the, with the correct content. Okay, just for anybody wondering about that. So moving on, thin lines then. <clears throat> I love using thin lines in design, by the way, guys. One of my favorites. Because... Thin lines, obviously, they're fragile, okay? So they, so they appear easy to break or to knock over. But I also think they have a very elegant quality to them, okay? They, they give that sense of elegance to your designs also. I, I mean, you can see from the example of the logo in front of you there, would you agree that if this logo was in very heavy, dense lines, it, it definitely wouldn't have this sense of elegance about it. Would you agree with that? 
Everyone agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, they are thin, they are fragile, they appear easy to break, but and they're you know they're quite frail, but they do have that sense of elegance as well that I really like using in design. On the opposite end of the spectrum then, we have our thick lines. These obviously appear much more difficult to break. Uh, they suggest strength and they give emphasis to elements also. They also make a bold statement. Now this is another example of a logo using quite thick designs now too this time, okay? Just to reinforce that sort of structural element to the design also. So the, as I said, they really give that emphasis to it and are, they're quite bold obviously by their nature too. Horizontal lines then, these are obviously parallel to the horizon, hence the name. But if you look at them, they look like they're lying down or they're at rest or they're asleep. And because of this then, they suggest a sort of a, a, a calmness and a quietness about them. Because they can't fall over either. They're also used, of course, to accentuate width. But they're very stable and they're very secure. And also because um, horizontal lines, by their connection to the horizon, they're also associated with sort of earthbound ideas as well. And you can see the Stenaline logo in front of you there on your screens too. I know this is basically a line underlying the name, but it's also, it makes that connection to the sea, okay? Obviously Stenaline are a shipping company, so it makes that connection to the horizon and makes that connection to the sea. Does that make sense? If you have a few people commenting, never thought about it like that. Well, this is what you're here to learn, guys. This is what you're here to learn, okay? Okay, is there horizontal lines? Vertical lines then, obviously the complete opposite, are perpendicular to the horizon. Because of this, they're filled with a much more potential energy. You know, they, they, they feel like if they're released, for example, they could fall over. Uh, but vertical lines, especially when they're thicker, are quite strong and quite rigid. And they can suggest stability then, as I said, especially when thicker. Obviously, we can use them to accentuate height as well. Um, and, you know, because of their, their tallness and their formality, they do give an impression of dignity also. So we can see the Alliance Insurance Group here using them to, to good effect, to give that impression of formality and to give that impression of dignity as well. Okay? Uh, just a second now as well. What does perpendicular mean? Brett has asked me. Perpendicular means, it, when I say vertical lines are perpendicular to the horizon, so they're going against it, so they're going up, whereas the horizon is going across, Brett, okay? So diagonal lines, again, these are used, um, they're getting quite common. Uh, the diagonal lines and triangles, I'm actually noticing myself, are becoming sort of quite trendy um, in design at the moment too. As I said, design does go through trends. But diagonal lines are unbalanced, okay? They're filled with an uncontrolled energy, all right? Because they can appear to be either rising or falling, and they convey that sense of action, that sense of motion. They have a kinetic energy associated with them, and it, they create tension and excitement. So for example, if I was to ask you there, do you think th these lines are rising or falling? Okay, give me a rising or falling. We'll sort out the optimist from the pessimist I get on this lesson. Okay, most people saying rising. Good, that's good. Okay, a few falling. Okay, but most people saying rising. Uh, as you can see, Adidas, the, uh, the sporting brand, obviously use them to great effect here, to great effect uh, because they're obviously a sporting brand and it creates that sense of movement and that sense of excitement as well. Okay, so would you agree with that? You can see how they're using them to very, very good effect. Okay, yeah, indeed, indeed. Okay, guys, just give, just do, just quickly now, one quick sound check. Uh, I uh, just heard there having some audio issues, so just give me a quick yes or a no if the sound is okay for you. Sorry about this now, guys. Just some gremlins this evening over here in Dublin. All good, all good. Okay, that's great, guys. Okay, so moving on, moving on then. Curve lines then are often, these are obviously softer than straight lines because they sweep and they turn gracefully between endpoints. They're less definite and they're less predictable than straight lines. But they're often used in obviously to, to express sort of fluid movement as well. Because, and they can bend, they can change direction. But the thing to remember about curve lines is they can either be quite calm or they can be quite dynamic depending on how much they curve. So the less active the curve, the calmer the feeling, okay? And obviously you can see Intel using them to very, very good effect to give that sort of fluid motion, that fluid movement of their products as well, okay? Now, we're getting into the sort of fun ones of the group now as well, zigzag lines, okay? What are zigzag lines made up of, guys? Because this all, it all feeds into each other. What are, what are zigzag lines made up of? Diagonal lines, of course. Yeah, everyone coming through there. 
because zigzag lines are made up of diagonal lines, they are, of course, very dynamic. They take on that really high energy characteristics of those lines, very much create that sense of excitement and intense movement. They can also sort of convey confusion and, and, and nervousness because they change direction quickly and frequently. And it can also use to imply sort of danger and destruction. Obviously, for anybody out there, <clears throat> Not quite of my generation, but if you remember the old sort of Batman series or comic books, things like that, you see them used to really good effect in a lot of those as well. So they're using to create that sense of, uh, of urgency and of being very dynamic, okay? And then we're moving on, then we have artificial versus natural lines then as well. Because basically, you know, along perfectly even lines, they do feel artificial. Because nature itself is not is never perfectly straight, you know. Uh, the Earth wasn't designed in straight lines, <clears throat> and because because of this, then, if we want to make it seem more natural, we can add, you know, a little, a slight variation to it. And you'll see these used an awful lot. You you'll notice in things like organic produce, uh, maybe even farmers markets, things like that. Very much associated with food and that sort of thing as well. Okay. And this is why, because they obviously look much, much more, uh, much more natural as well. Sheena is saying sort of rustic, shabby, chic. Indeed, indeed as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then finally, we have dashed or dotted lines, okay? Um, these are generally could be thought of as implied lines as well, because they're not complete. Uh, and because they're incomplete, they allow objects to pass through them. Okay, now I think our, our, I think our vertical sort of line, our, our dashed or dotted line, should I say, is still quite strong, but it's obviously not as strong as if it were completely solid. And if you look at the Tesco logo, for example, which is of course a, um, a supermarket retailer, uh, of course, if you're going to a supermarket, what do you do? You pass through the doors, you go into the supermarket. So you're sort of passing through the threshold and going in. Now, I know you can read into this as much or as little as you like, but it's important for us to understand. All right? Okay. Uh, Rachel is asking me a question. Can you use the term kerning to refer to the space between dashed lines not read no kerning is definitely more associated with letters rachel and we go through that in very much so in our typography lesson in lesson seven too but much more for letters because we need to see the space as equal whereas dashed or dotted lines can have differing spaces and we'll actually give you an example of that now as well in just a second because after this we're going to start talking about line patterns okay now obviously we just looked at our lines what do you get when you form a series of lines you get a patterns and even patterns can have their own individual meanings as well okay and it's important for us to understand these okay now parallel lines of uniform width and spacing create a sort of a static or an orderly effect okay and it doesn't even matter if the lines are horizontal or vertical or diagonal. You know, they create that orderly effect. And even if we look at an example of sort of curve lines even, now they're still sort of, um, they're still, are, th these are still lines of parallel uh, width and spacing, but it definitely gives a sense of movement. Would you agree with that in this, in this Umbrella logo? You can, you can get that sense of movement from the logo just by stacking them together, okay? Now these are quite orderly, okay, because they're uniform. But what happens when you start mixing them up, okay? Maybe by varying the spacing between lines. Even varying the spacing between lines of equal thickness can convey that sense of motion as well, as you can see here in the parallel example. But on the other hand then, if you really want to go nuts altogether, uh, and if you want to even vary both the thicknesses and, of course, the spacing, then you get a really, really chaotic, disorderly effect. Lots of people, uh, who's there, Clive, would say much more tension. You get a barcode. You don't get a barcode as well. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. For it. But again, you can really bring in that sense of sort of chaos to it and that much more disorderly effect. If, again, that is the message that you're trying to get across. You know, as I said, we as designers are visual communicators. And if that's the message you want to get across, that's fair enough. And again, don't forget, guys, lines can be made up of any type or any shape placed one after the other. OK, so even it could be, um, you know, little squares on, on a page or something like that. If they're placed one after the other, they are they are creating lines, essentially. All right. OK, so that's line, guys. OK, OK, <laughs> good bit to get through there. Are we happy with that before we move on to shape? Have you ever thought about lines in such a way? 
I'm sure you have. <laughs> okay, good. Well, like I said, guys, today's class, today's lesson, no matter if you're an amateur, professional, or just an avid enthusiast, it's all about understanding how we as designers use these, use these to our best effect. So there's lines. We're going to look at shape now next. So when we look at shapes, okay, what do you feel when you see, for example, a circle or a square or a triangle? Um, and ask yourself, is it the same? Are you affected the same way uh, if you see something with much more sharp, jagged edges or even sort of softer, gentler curves in as well? Because just like lines of meanings, shapes also have meanings. And these are a very important building block on the visual grammar and the visual thinking we have at our disposals. I remember saying to you in lesson one that I will teach you how to think visually. And once you understand these, you will understand how to do that. And it's a skill that you will learn. Okay. Now, shapes have endless characteristics as well, each communicating different messages to your audience. And even if it's just paragraphs of text on a page, you're still creating shapes. You're creating maybe squares or rectangles just with text, okay? So no matter what we're designing, we are basically creating shapes. So we need to ask ourselves, what shapes do we have at our disposal? What do these say to our viewers? And how they can enhance or detract from the concept that you actually want to convey as well. So the basic shape types, just like we have line types, we also have shape types. And again, if you refer to your toolkits, guys, there's much more explanations given in those as well. Okay, so have a look at those in your notes and there's more explanations of these also in there. But geometric shapes are the first, then we have natural or organic shapes. And then finally, we have what we call abstract shapes. So geometric shapes, these are simple. These are what everybody thinks of as shapes, they're circles, they're squares, they're triangles, whatever you like, because they're easily recognizable. And because they're sort of recognizable and they're quite regular, they suggest organization, they suggest structure. Generally too, geometric shapes will tend to be symmetrical, okay? This again suggests further order, okay? On the other end of the spectrum then, we have natural or organic shapes. These are irregular. Generally, they, they will be asymmetrical. They won't be symmetrical because they generally have more curves. They're more uneven. But we as humans tend to find these shapes a little bit more pleasing, a little bit more comforting. Okay. Obviously, they're representative of nature as well. And they're quite organic. Okay. And even if you want to get organic shapes into design, for example, photographs would be examples of, of organic shapes. Okay. So that is how we can get those type of shapes into design as well. Abstract shapes then, quite fun. Um, these, of course, have a recognizable form, but they're not real. These are basically stylized or simplified versions. Can you give me a few examples of abstract shapes that you see? Everybody's using them day to day. Can I give you a few examples? Symbols, there's his Nicky Hayes. Uh, yeah, okay, icons as well, of course, yeah. Disable signs there, emoticons, the Apple logo. Of course, there's loads of them. And because of this, guys, they're universal. Most of them are universally recognized. So we can use these in design as well. And it's, it's quite, they're quite handy to use if you're maybe working across different cultures and things like that. Okay, so abstract shapes, we can use them uh, to, to good effect in our designs also. So the first thing we'll look at then is circles. Obviously, these have no beginning or end. They, you know, they, they, they represent a sort of an eternal whole. Uh, very much associated with femininity as well, by the way. But because you know, because you know, they're well rounded, they're complete. They have movement, of course, well, so they can roll. Okay, and uh, they're actually a little bit less common in design, so they do attract attention, and they can sort of provide emphasis, and of course, set things apart. As you can see, as I just mentioned, there they can roll, and here we can see examples of using gesture lines to add that sense of movement to the circle. Okay. But as I said, they do offer sort of safety and a sort of connection because they can either sort of protect and restrict what's within them or they can also keep things out as well. OK, but like I said, um, you, they are less commonly used in design, so they can work well to attract that attention as well. We, you know, we're much more used to seeing squares and rectangles in design, too. So moving on to our squares and rectangles then as well. Again, these are, of course, very stable because they're very familiar and they're, they're, they're sort of trusted shapes. So they suggest honesty. Uh, they also, of course, have right angles. So this then represents, you know, rationality and formality. Now, very much so, rectangles are probably the most common geometric shape encountered. As I said, even paragraphs of text are essentially rectangular shapes. 
Um, but because, you know, squares and rectangles, they suggest sort of conformity and security. Um, but because they're so familiar and quite common, they can seem a little bit boring as well. They can seem a little bit boring in design too. So a little tip for that is if maybe just, you know, maybe tilt them on their edges every now and again, just to give a little bit of an unexpected twist, okay? And this will generally help sort of designs to stand out a little bit more as well. So it's just a little bit, just a little bit of a tip there as well, if you are using these in your designs, to maybe help things stand out as well, okay? So they are squares. Now triangles, these are probably again, just like diagonal lines, probably one of my favourites to use in design because they, again, they represent that dynamic tension as well. Because they can either be stable or unstable, okay? If they're, if they're sitting on their base, they're quite stable. If they're sitting on a corner, they're obviously unstable. But again, to you know, emphasize that dynamic tension. You often see them used, of course, in road safety signs. They're perfect for this, okay, because they give that impression. And they have an energy and a power associated with them as well. Because of this, they're seen as much more masculine, by the way. So while circles are much more feminine, triangles then are much more masculine, okay? They represent masculinity much more. And we can always see them in things like symbols for, for law and for science. Even in, um, even in religion, we see them used quite a lot as well. And of course, they can sort of point in, the, in, a, in a direction. Okay, so we can use them to do that too as well. And because of this, they do give a sense of progression and a sense of sort of direction. And here we can see actually the Delta Airlines use them to really good effect in their logo too. Obviously an airline company. Which way is the triangle pointing? Which way the triangle is pointing? Of course, they're pointing up to the, to, the, to the sky because they're an airline. But also, you can take a lot out of it. It's representative of wings, even the nose of a plane. People, people sort of get that from it too. But it gives that sense of, you know, direction in their, in their logo as well. Okay? So is that making sense to everybody so far? Triangle is much more expressive, says Felicity out there. Indeed, indeed. Very good. Okay, guys. And then finally... The last of our, I know the second last of our shapes, sorry. We have spirals. Again, you, you, you rarely see these used in design, to be honest with you. But they're very much expressions of creativity. And we see them associated much more in sort of natural growth patterns. And, uh, and we see them as a process of evolution, okay? Because they, gi they give a sense of sort of, of birth, of death, of transformation. And even a sort of cycles of time as well. Um, and, you know, because you, they're obviously they're, they're, they're quite uncommon. But where you do see them is again in uh, maybe religious or mystical symbolism. Okay? Just like our spirals here that you see, well, for example, in Ireland and all over the world, actually. It's quite interesting that this spiral shape in lots of cultures who would probably never have met, but they still managed to come up with this sort of spiral shape to, to give that sense of growth and of evolution in that too. All right. Or Doctor Who says Michael Bittner out there as well. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Uh, uh, Iman is saying we see them in visual tricks also. And the, uh, just like hypnosis as well. Indeed, indeed. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. So, just a quick one for you too. Quite interesting. Is that clockwise spirals are said to represent the projection of an intention. So if you intend to do something or you have a project or a company uh, and you want to represent a, uh, represent a projection of intention, you can use sort of clockwise spirals. Whereas on the other hand then, counterclockwise spirals, like you see here with the Hilton Hotel Group, they're using a counterclockwise spiral and this represents the fulfillment of an intention. So they fulfill their intentions. So I just I think that's quite interesting too as well. Okay. And then finally, a quick one then, just crosses. Of course, we're all familiar with these. Uh, very much, of course, symbolizing spirituality and healing. Um, they're seen as sort of a divine meeting place, I guess. Um, but they can, again, suggest sort of transition. They suggest sort of balance and faith as well. Um, okay, so like I said, we see them used a lot. But even in Windows, I probably should have updated this to Windows 10 by now. But even Windows 8 there, for example, while there are four squares there, in the negative space, there's also a cross, okay? So it's a meeting place of all of their products, basically, all right? Now, that's negative space. Negative space is something, by the way, it's one of my passions in design and graphic design. It's a whole subject in itself, nearly. And again, that is actually something we look at in much, much more detail in, uh, in our advanced course also. But we'll be looking a little bit at negative space in our logo design lesson uh, next week too, guys, okay? So very much looking forward to that. So guys, they are our shapes. 
Okay, we had circles, squares, triangles, spirals, and crosses. Okay, so everyone happy with that to move on? Again, just like lines, understanding your shapes is very, very important, all right? Okay, brilliant. So, color now. Now, here we go. Color is a big one. Color is probably the most powerful tool that a designer can use. And we need to understand how color affects us in communicating messages effectively. Because I keep going back to it, guys. Graphic designers are visual communicators. But there's a few things to remember about color. The first thing is color is relative. So what you see and what I see may be slightly different versions of the same color. So while we have three different reds there, you know, I might even have just one red there, but we each see slightly different variations of it. Um, when I talk about the absence of color then, this is what I mean. Good, um, good design should work in the absence of color, okay? So if you look at the Apple logo there, for example, even when you take all the colors away, even in a straight monochromatic scheme there, even the straight black one, the design still works. It's not using color to enhance the design. It's not using color. Color hasn't become the design. Whereas if you look at the enhance uh, uh, graphic there, this is what the designer has done here. They have used color to enhance the design, okay? And it's sort of become the design. Whereas when you take the color away, it's just a basic, uh, it's just a basic shape, okay? So this is what I mean. You, you shouldn't use color. Color shouldn't become the design. It should enhance it, okay? But it shouldn't become it, okay? Does that make sense before I move on? Because that's very, very important. And it's a trap that a lot of, um, a lot of designers fall into, a lot of amateur designers fall into. And as I said, guys, you know, color is... Different people will read colors in different ways. As a designer, this is something, this is a quote from clients that I get quite a lot. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but I get lots of things like, I really like the color, but can you change it? Okay, and that's because people will have different perceptions of color as well. All right, so just be aware of that and you know, your patience will be tested. But we use color in design in, with, with contrast. And I will be speaking a lot about contrast in the coming lessons too. Because we need to create good contrast in design as well to make things stand out. Obviously, even to make things like, like text, make it legible also as well. But color and contrast go together as well. So we use color to create that contrast. You, of course, also then use color to grab attention, to grab attention as well, all right? Um, it is an attention getter, okay? But quite interestingly, what we learn right now is that color can even um, subconsciously evoke feelings, all right? Or even, even manifest itself physically on us as well. Because studies have shown that people in mostly red environments actually suffer higher blood pressure, have faster heart rates than people in mostly blue environments, okay? So, you know, maybe anybody out there may be feeling a little bit stressed out at the moment, maybe paint your walls blue and it might help with your predicament as well okay <laughs> so does that make sense so far yeah it does okay brilliant brilliant so we're going to examine this now it's it's a fascinating subject how color can i said even evoke subconscious feelings and even even red is said to stimulate hunger and thirst as well this is why you see it used a lot in sort of fast food chains and things like that also but as I said, color is one of the most important parts of your design and it shouldn't be an afterthought okay because it helps to it helps to give that sense of information too as well all right but and yet like i said there you'll often find people saying you know um they look at your designs and they'll base it upon the color and they are making up their mind whether they like it or not as well but they won't be able to tell you why they like it or they don't like it so it's up to us as designers to sort of guide them and to, and to explain to them why we use certain colors in the way we do so We'll see what color has. We'll see what color has to say about this down in a second as well. So actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you guys out there now. Don't answer me straight away. Do not answer me in the question boxes right now. But I'm going to ask you to think of a brand um, that say I'm going to pick a color there. Say use the color green. Okay. Actually, no. I'm going to go orange because it's nice and bright. Think of a brand that uses the color orange a lot. Okay. Now, don't answer me right now. We'll get to it in a few minutes, and we'll see then if it represents that brand well. Okay. So just to store that in your heads for a few minutes. So we're going to continue now by looking at colors and their treatments in design and explain the basic, uh, the color basics. So how does it work? How do we use it? And how does it even affect our mood? But we as designers, we need to understand the physical color theory as well. We need to understand how color actually works. 
all right? So we're going to look at that now first as well, and then we'll go on to the more psychological color theory about what emotions do our colors convey, the mood it conveys, and how we can use this to our advantage. Well, the first things first, I'm going to explain how color actually works. So color obviously exists all around us. So physical objects, when struck by light, they will reflect back wavelengths of light to our eyes. So if we have an apple on the table in front of us, uh, a red apple, um, red is the only color reflected back towards us. So it's absorbing all of those wavelengths of light except for red. And that is why we perceive this apple as being red. Which is quite interesting because, as I said, it's absorbing all the light except for red and that's what's bouncing back to our eyes, okay? But the one idea about this in this regard, it depends on one important idea, that wavelengths of light are subtracted as they're reflected back off an object. Now, when we're using computer screens as designers, we are using what we call additive color. So this is reflective color. It's reflecting back off physical objects. But on the screen, we're using additive color. And monitors display color in a much different way because they have to generate their own light. Okay, because it must generate their own light, they must generate their own color as well. So this is what happens. So for example, if I want to get the color purple on a screen, the pixels will light up the blue and the red pixels. So the red and blue pixels will light up, giving me the color purple. Okay, and this is what we call additive color. We are adding light to create that color. Okay, so just quickly before we move on, now does that make sense to people? Okay, because I do get a lot of uh, confusion about that too. So quickly, that makes sense, yeah? Okay, good, good, excellent, excellent, guys. So look at this, guys, uh, our color wheel. Anybody know who invented the color wheel? Anybody know where it came from? People must, must remember this from back in their school days when we had no idea, no idea. Actually, oh, very good. Who is that? That is Mary out there, Newton. And Kelly was very quick there as well. It was indeed Isaac Newton. Now, the color wheel is basically, it's a visual tool that we use as designers and we apply it to color theory. As I said, it was actually Newton, Isaac Newton, that came up with it way back in the, I think it was around 1666 or thereabouts. Um, and what he did was he arranged red, orange, uh, yellow, blue, a uh, green, blue, indigo and violet into a natural progression on a disc. And when he span the disc, if you spin the disc at the correct rate then, all of the colors will blur together so rapidly that we will actually see white. So he actually broke it down, he broke the whole lot down. So on our color wheel, we have of course our three primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue. Okay, we, when we mix these colors together then, we get our secondary colors, okay? And then again, when we mix these together again, we get our tertiary colors, all right? So that's how we get our tertiary colors. Uh, and again, when we talk about complementary colors, we're going to talk about now in a second. Complementary colors are sometimes called contrasting colors or any two colors which are directly opposite each other on the color wheel. So for example, we would have our violet red and our yellow green there. These would be complementary colors. So we're going to look at those now next and why they are so important in design. But before that, I'm going to try a little experiment. I'm going to try an experiment to see if this works. I hope it does. I'm going to ask you to look at the red rectangle for a few seconds. Now, don't burn out your, your retinas or anything. But I'm going to ask you to look at the rectangle on your screens. Look at the focus on the red rectangle. I'm then going to turn off the red rectangle. And I want you to keep looking at the screens. And I want you to remember what color you see once I turn off the red rectangle. So I'm going to take a quick sip of water while you're doing that. And just want you to remember what you see afterwards, OK? Okay, I think that's enough. I don't want you to strain your eyes or anything. So I'm going to ask you, know, what colours did you see? What colour do you see now when you keep looking at it? Cyan there, Sir McDonald, blue, uh, cyan, light blue, light blue. Yeah, it would generally be a sort of lighter version of this colour. Am I correct? I am. Okay, yeah, that's correct. Very good, very good. Well, guys, how did I know that? How do you think I knew that's what you were going to see? This is how it works, guys, okay? Um... Basically, the photoreceptors in your eye, in your retina, uh, that respond to colour come in three varieties that we call red, green and blue. So these are your photoreceptors in your eyes. 
So when you were looking at the red on the screen there, your red, you know, it got quite tired, okay? But your, but your, but your green and your blue photoreceptors, they had loads of time to rest, okay? So they got a little bit of rest, your red got quite tired. So then when I turned off the red color and you kept looking at the screen, your green and your blue photoreceptors sort of, you know, kicked into action, okay? Because your red was too tired. And what do we, what color do we get when we mix green and blue together? we of course get cyan, we get the color that you just saw, okay? So again, that's how we perceive and how we look at colors as well. Again, really, really interesting as well. And it's quite a handy experiment. By the way, the same thing will work with all of your, um, with all of your primary colors. So you can maybe try that in your own time at home as well, okay? So, now, you might be wondering, okay, you know, what does this mean? How, you know, how, how, what's, what has this got to do with design? Okay, this is how it works. This is why it works in design. As I said, guys, you can look at the color wheel there. We were looking at red. Our red got tired, our green and our blues kicked into action. And when we mixed it all together, we get that cyan as well, guys. So that's how it works. But in design, we use these complementary or contrasting colors because they will make each other seem brighter as well. Okay. So just like, say, our blue and our orange there, so our blue and our orange. I mean, there's a reason, for example, why life rafts and life vests are orange, because they are the complementary color of blue. So they will stand out the most against that color. And they will even make each other appear a little bit brighter in design, too, if we use these colors together. And we see them used quite a lot. Complementary colors are used quite a lot, especially in things like cartoons, um, movie posters for specific cartoons. I just saw, there was one I saw there lately, The Life of Pets, for example, uses orange and blue to quite good effect. But they're quite sort of playful as well. And they're quite strong. They're very, very strong. And we can see the Firefox logo using it here as well. But these complementary colors will sort of balance each other out. Okay? Because they're opposite ends. They will balance each other out basically. Okay? All right. Now, just a second as well before we move on again. Is that making sense to everybody there as well? Rachel is making the point there. It's warm and cool colors, of course. Yeah, because, and because of that, they are balancing each other out. Okay, and it's all in design. It's all about creating that balance as well. All right. You should never sort of go too nuts or overstimulate your audience. Unless, of course, that's your bag. But, um, you know, just be careful about it. It's all about creating balance as well. Now, okay. Moving on then, we have analogous colors now next. Now these are quite simple. And again, if you refer to your toolkit notes, there's more explanations on these in there for you guys. But analogous colors are quite simple and they're quite safe when coming up with your own designs. Analogous colors basically sit beside each other on the color wheel. So for example, if you pick a green here and pick it, the colors beside it, I get my yellow green, my yellow and my orange yellow. These are analogous colors. They sit beside each other on the color wheel. They're quite easy to use in design because they won't clash with each other. Okay, so if you're starting out and you're a bit unsure, it's a good idea to maybe start with these. Start with these sort of analogous colors. They won't clash together uh, too, too, too much on your to great effect as well. Okay, so these are analogous colors. Finally, then, we have what we call rectangular color schemes. Now, these are a little bit more complex, okay? Rectangular color schemes, um, they're very hard to work with uh, because, unfortunately, your design can end up looking a bit like a rainbow. And if that's what you want, that's fair enough. That's why NBC used them here to very good effect. But basically, to get a, a rectangular color scheme, all you're doing is basically drawing the rectangular square over your color wheel and where the four points, uh, uh, each point will represent a color, basically. So that's how you come up with these color schemes. But again, just be careful if this is something that you're working with because it can look a little bit intense or, like I said, look a little bit like a rainbow as well, guys, okay? Um, Lucy's asked me, is there a special name in graphic design for white and black colors? Yeah, the, you're right, Lucy. You've just, you've just answered your own question. These are what we call color neutrals, okay? So we're, we're focusing on our basic color wheel, but for like our blacks, our grays, our, our, our browns, our, you know, beiges, these are what we call color neutrals, okay? But we are concentrating on the basic ones for today's class as well, guys, okay? So... Getting down out of this psychological color theory. As I said, color is an important tool for non-verbal communication. So we're going to go through now what people naturally think of when they see different colors and the emotions and the feelings associated with them. First of all, we have our warm colors. Now these will sort of pull forward in a design, all right? They will sort of push forward in your design. We have red, orange, and yellow. 
When we think of rage, what do we think of? We think of energy, of power and of passion, even of course of love as well. When we think of orange then, we have sort of happiness, enthusiasm, um, attraction. Yellow then is very cheerful, it's very attention seeking, uh, it's quite stimulatory as well. So actually I'm going to ask you guys out there now, what was the, um, what was the company, what was the brand you were thinking of when I asked you to think of a brand that uses the colour orange? I have Fanta, Sainsbury's, Firefox, uh, Harley Davidson, <laughs> LucasAid, the, obviously the orange phone network themselves. Okay, very good. SoundCloud, Nickelodeon, there's Yusuf as well. Okay, very, very good. Very, very good. Rockstar, MasterCard as well. Yeah, lots of Fantas and EasyJet even coming through. Well, guys, would you agree then? I mean, when we think of orange, we think of happiness, we think of enthusiasm, we think of attraction. Do you think that suits those particular brands who would give that sense of sort of fun, of playfulness, you know? And like orange is quite interesting because you obviously get orange from red and yellow. So even when we mix these, when we mix red and yellow together to create orange, orange will take on the properties of those colours. So when we get orange, we end up with sort of happiness, enthusiasm. But this comes from red and yellow, which are like energetic, uh, quite cheerful, quite playful. So they will, once you mix colours together, they will actually take on some of the properties of their initial colours. Okay, so quite an interesting one to remember too when you're designing. Finally, then we have our cool colours. These will sort of push backward in a design as well. They sort of recede into the background a little bit more. We have our green, our blue, and our purple. Uh, it's, you know, so green is obviously quite refreshing. It's quite, it's quite a fresh color. Uh, also very much associated with prestige. I guess it's the color of money, I guess, too. Uh, but can be quite cooling and quite calming. When we think of blue, then, blue is by far, by the way, guys, male and female's favorite color is by far blue. But it differs then after that, too. Okay, but blue is by far uh, male and female. <laughs> it's been proven that it's their favorite color. So blue is quite reliable. It's quite trustworthy. It's quite dependable. And purple then, on the other hand, very much associated. Actually, Shane is just making a comment there in the question box. Um, uh, is uh, spirituality ceremony Christopher L Christopher's asking um, is this live it is Christopher I can see you out there Christopher L so yes it is indeed I can see you um, purple then very much associated with spirituality uh, with, with royalty with ceremony basically because of course purple was a very expensive color to create the actual dye itself was extremely expensive to um, to purchase. Uh, so back in the good old days, it was only the more affluent people could afford it, like our um, like our royalty and, uh, and and our and our spiritual guys as well, I guess, of course, too. You know. Okay, so just a second now as well. So that is that, yeah. So that's we've covered color. And like I said, guys, we'll be going back over this in future lessons too. So I'm just glancing over it for today. But again, as I said, color, very much one of the most important elements. Now we're going to quickly cycle through the rest of them, but the main ones were our line shape and our color. So we'll quickly go through the rest now in just a couple of minutes and go on then with the Q&A in a second too, because we will be revisiting these as we progress through the course also. I just want to make you aware of these before you, we continue on. So another element then is texture. This is pretty straightforward, guys. Everyone knows what texture is. It simply refers to the characteristics of a surface. And it can be tactile as well as visual. So obviously on the screen we're seeing it. But we can, of course, hold texture in our hands too for print and things like that. Uh, and it really adds a sort of an emotional sort of real life response as well. Okay, and we can use texture to quite good effect in our designs. You need to be careful doing it though. So, for example, when we use texture, we generally want it to be related to the content in which it's inserted. So it'll either maybe complement or strengthen something. So for example, if we look at the good old Apple icons here, sort of more old school Apple icons, these are without texture. So if I look at them now with texture, which ones do you prefer? Do you prefer the sort of, uh, I'm going to call it left to right, so left for non-texture, right for texture. <coughs> Everybody coming through there with right, yeah, yeah, a few people coming through left, and we'll see more sort of uh, flash design enthusiasts. But guys, you know, textures create very much a more three-dimensional appearance, of course, as well, and it helps to build a more immersive world. It tends to draw you in. But it's, it's essentially a secondary element that sort of uh, reinforces the visual concept of your designs as well. So just like we see there, we have a sort of a glass texture on the compass. We have a sort of a torn paper on our notepad there. You know, we have our, our metal elements there too as well. So it sort of reinforces the message, okay? But very simple to use as well, guys. So just to make you aware of that. So that is texture. 
Moving on then, we have mass. Mass is an interesting one too. Mass basically equals size. It's the physical mass or size uh, of the actual dimensions of the piece. Okay, but it, it not just equates to the actual size of the piece, but also of the elements within that piece too. So our text, our images will also have a mass within that. Okay, so for example, if you had um, if you had a physically small brochure, uh, it can have a great deal of mass through the use of quite heavy text and, and, and heavy graphic elements. Whereas if you had a physically large brochure, it can actually appear smaller and lighter by using maybe text and graphics much more sparingly. Again, I give the example on the screens in front of you. If you had a photo, for example, uh, say it was the same size photo, it can appear either larger or smaller depending on the physical size of the piece of paper. Okay, And a good example of this, this is what I mean by this, by the way, so this is essentially mass and effect, mass and action. I mean, you know, do you think, which side do you think is using mass to better effect here? <clears throat> indeed, indeed, indeed. Very good, very good. Yeah, of course, of course. So this is, this is what I mean by using mass in design to sort of reinforce themes as well, guys. Okay, finally then moving on to space. Again, space is something we look at very much so in Lesson 8 as well, guys, especially when designing for screen can be very, very important. So space is something we look at much more detail in Lesson 8. But just to make you aware of what it is, space, or some people call it white space, but it doesn't actually need to be white. It's just basically empty space or sort of negative space, all right? It's the distance between or around things. And we need space in design to give the users a visual rest, to give their eye a visual rest, and even to guide the user's eye. In design, we use space to tell the user where to look. And of course, it is, of course, very important for legibility. Uh, think of text. You know, text needs space around it to be able to read it. And even aesthetically then too. When I talk about aesthetically, um, you know, people tend to prefer things that are uncluttered and a little bit more elegant as well. Say so again, is just making a point. It also makes text less intimidating as well. It is indeed. No one likes to read huge, huge paragraphs of text with no space around it. It's just, it's just, it's just you just don't like doing it. As simple as that. Um, but again, it can help to give definition to graphic elements that then are actually displayed on your page, whether it be screen or print or wherever it is. So you know. Try not to cram lots of things together because it, it becomes difficult to distinguish what's important. Okay, and again, it's all about messaging. If, we, if we're asking the user to do too much work, they will be turned off it by as well. Now, again, there will be some exceptions to this rule. You will see some sort of clutter designs that are designed for that reason. Maybe they want to give a sense of sort of chaos or something like that. So there will be exceptions as well. But generally, I think professional designers will always use white space or negative space to good effect. And I mean, the prime example that we use day to day is of course Google, a very, very simple page, but our eye goes directly to that search bar. It goes directly to the search area because Google with space is telling us that's the most important element on the page and that's where we should be looking. Okay, it's very, very simple. Now, okay, so they are our elements, guys. We got, a, we got through a good bit of information there now, okay? But like I said, do refer to your toolkits for more information too, as well, guys, too. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to very, very quickly go through our principles, and we'll continue on then with the Q&A in just a couple of minutes also. So I will quickly go through these because we'll be coming back to them in Lesson 8 and in future lessons too. But for today, I just want to make you aware of them. So while our elements were like our ingredients, our principles then, think of them like your recipe. These are what we do to our design elements. And as you can see there, how we apply them determines how successful the design will be. So we'll quickly go through now alignment, balance, contrast, proximity and repetition as well. Okay. Uh, okay, now alignment. This, everybody knows what alignment is. If you've, you've used a word processor or anything, you know what alignment is. Alignment is very important in design though um, because it allows you to range elements in the way that matches how people will actually scan or read your information or read your page. And it, it helps to balance out your image as well so that it's visually appealing. But I just want to make you aware, we do have sort of two types of alignment. We have either edge or center. So edge alignment will sort of naturally position elements against a margin that matches up to their edges. And this is probably the most common technique. It's very much so the most common alignment. But you also have then center alignment too. But 
even if we, we, by the way, we can have central alignment even on a diagonal line, for example. We can still align things centrally even if the line is going diagonally as well, okay? But again, alignment is very, very important and it should nearly go unnoticed by the user or by the viewer as well. But it is very, very important and it is something we'll be looking at now later on in the series too. Now, I'll see you with our text alignments then. Okay, we have center, left, right, and justified. Just a very quick note on these, and I do go into more detail in your notes as well, guys. But I just want to make you aware, centered alignment is what a lot of amateur designers will go to straight away. Do try to avoid center alignment, especially for large paragraphs of text, because they're quite weak, because our eye has no natural border to follow. It's constantly moving, okay? It's constantly moving, and hence we get quite tired looking at it. So a left alignment is generally the safest, the strongest alignment to use. Right alignment, I know in different cultures, this will change slightly too, okay? So for my friends out in maybe the Far East or in the, um, Saudi region, regions, areas like that. I know there is differences here. There is culture differences. But left alignment is probably the strongest. Right alignment, again, can be interesting to use because it's quite rare in most cultures. Then finally, we have justified alignments. These can be tricky because you can get sort of large swaths of space between your, between your letters too as well, guys. So just to be aware of that, okay? And again, a quick one to remember, guys. Don't ever try to stretch out your fonts. I see some amateur designers always doing this. Trust me, it just looks amateur. It's not professional. So don't try and stretch things to fit, okay? We'll be talking about this in further detail in our typography lessons as well, guys. So don't worry about that. But, you know, please don't fall into that trap as well, okay? Now, balance then, this is, again is pretty straightforward. It's simply the weight distributed in the design by the placement of your elements. And again, it provides stability, it provides structure as well. And in balance, we're adjusting what I call the visual weight of each element in terms of scale, of color, and of contrast. So if you've got quite a heavy element, it may be one corner of your page, you might want to balance it out with maybe lighter, larger elements to create that sense of balance. But again, it can be tricky depending on whether it's symmetrical or asymmetrical. So when it's asymmetrical then, um, the balance occurs when we, just, when we describe the visual weight of the elements. So for example, we might have smaller, darker elements balanced out with larger, lighter ones. Okay? You're sort of playing visual games here to achieve that sense of balance and to get that sense of contrast as well in your page. All right? Okay, so that's balance. Pretty straightforward. Contrast then, again, we will be talking a lot about this later on. We all know what contrast is. It is simply the juxtaposition of opposing elements. Now, these could be colors, it could be values, it could even be direction. But contrast allows us to emphasize or highlight key areas in your design. Because without it, it basically looks boring. Your designs will look uninteresting. But again, we are telling the user where to look. So, for example, where, are you, where do you look at first there on your screens now? Which circle is, is the most important circle on that screen right now? Of course, because I am basically telling you, I am telling you that the black circle, second from the left there, is the most important element on that screen, okay? And I, as a designer, am telling you that, okay? Simply just with contrast. But we can use it in lots of other ways too. We can use it in sizing, in value, in quantity, even in weight with our fonts, for example, or typefaces. We can use contrast in placement, like you can see there on the example, and even with texture. We can create lots of contrast with texture as well. But so there is lots of different ways to use contrast in design too. And it's probably, it's a very, very important principle. Probably one of the main, main principles uh, in design is that use of contrast as well. And before we finish now, we have proximity. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's simply the process of ensuring that related elements are somehow grouped together. Now, if they're close in proximity, it'll indicate that they're connected or they've got some sort of relationship at least. Uh, it could be, for example, on a poster. It could be the time and date of a, of, of a function or something like that. Or it could be, you know, a price or something like that. You will want to, you know, have these connected in some way. So they can either be literally beside each other or you can also connect them with maybe color or positioning or something like that as well, guys. So proximity basically creates relationships between the elements, okay? As I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be placed right beside each other, but they should be connected in some visual way as well, okay? And then finally, guys, before we finish up now, we have, of course, repetition. 
uh, repetition, the final um, of our principles, this simply strengthens our design by tying together all of the individual elements. It creates consistency within your design as well. Can you see how I've used repetition in my presentation tonight, for example? How did I use it? Of course, everyone can see there, yeah, with my little my little teardrop icons there. Would you, do you agree that there was a sense of repetition throughout the, the presentation tonight by using those? Indeed, indeed. Okay, great. Well, this is it in action, guys. This is what I mean. Okay, so we'll go down now with the Q&A in just a second. But before we do that, we're going to understand how to put it all together. So let's have a look. Let's have a look, because this is what I want. The main things I want you to take out of today's lesson is how to put all of these together as well. So look at my poster on my screen there now. What do you think about my poster? Do you think it's good or bad? Messy, messy coming through there. It's bad, it is, it is disorder, yeah. So what would you do? What's the first thing you would do to maybe make this poster a little bit better? What's the first thing you think you'd do? Alignment there says, um, who's that coming through there? Christoph is very quick. Indeed, alignment. So what happens when I simply add some alignment? Okay, so I've aligned my elements a little bit better now. Now, I am using a few different alignments, by the way, you can see on your screens in front of you there. But is that a little bit better? A little bit better again, yeah, but not, not amazing either. Now, it's a very simple poster, don't get me wrong. I didn't go too mad on the design here, but a little bit better. So what else do you think I could add to this poster to make it a little bit better? Uh, better release be tweaks as David Klein, font change, some color, uh, some, something saying there, some livelier color, some mass, very interesting. Okay, so what happens now if I add in maybe some texture? So I've added in some texture and added a little bit more mass as well with my, with my sort of silhouette image. Am I getting a little bit better now? Getting better, getting better. I've also added in some repetition. Where can you see the repetition on the screens there, guys? How have I added repetition? Of course, my little blue dots, who's that through? That is a car, I think was through there. My little blue dots in the same color as well. Again, I'm not really, I could go one step more, I think it's still a little bit jarring to me. So I'm gonna add in maybe a little bit of color this time too, maybe a little bit better alignment too, and a little bit more mass. So finally moving on, is this better or worse again? A little bit more clearer? I've sort of made things stand out a little bit better, added some color. Again, a little bit more repetition with my blue lines, much more mass, for example, with my silhouette. And again, my alignment is quite strong. Some nice, strong alignment there as well, okay? So is this, okay, everyone says much, much better. Okay, so well, that's it, guys. I simply applied some of the principles that I've learned this evening, okay, uh, and of course my elements as well, but I apply them to that design in a logical manner, in a step-by-step -step manner, and I came out with a much better design. Would you agree? Indeed, everyone agrees there, yeah. Okay, simple as that, guys. So that is what I want you to get out of tonight's class. So this is what we covered, everyone. We covered our principles. We also covered our elements then as well, okay? And again, some people ask about the toolkits, just to make where there are in your student login area, you can purchase them, okay? There will be, of course, you all would have got your starter pack for free, that was a bonus that I've given you myself for free, but you will get your slides, your summary notes, and of course, your bonus video is actually also in there now to create your, um, to, to your digital painting, essentially, coloring in black and white images into color. So coming up in the next lesson then, guys, by the way, everyone just to make you clear make it clear for everybody your next lesson is lesson three and that will be available for you on friday in your student login area now it is our first on-demand lesson it is pre-recorded it is not live but in that lesson it's a really, really fun lesson, by the way, guys. Uh, you'll be creating a poster, but you'll also be creating an image composite. So what I mean by that, I'm gonna teach you how to combine multiple images together to create more sort of dynamic images. And I encourage you to use your own images too. Have a little bit of an experiment, see what you can come up with as well for your image composites. But I'll show you all of the, all of the tools and tricks you need to create your image composites and have some fun with it guys. You know, try and get some of your own images as well and have some fun with it too as well, okay? And just to let you know, your, your, your assignment, your weekly assignment will also be made available for you. But like I said, watch all of this week's lessons before you do your assignment, guys. And it's just, these are obviously optional, but they will help you in your final exam too, guys. So just to make you aware of that. And again, have a look too, guys. I do have a graphic design YouTube channel. 
Okay, so you can see on the screens in front of you there too. I will be posting weekly videos up there too. And as of um, as of tomorrow, there will I will also be posting a video up there tomorrow too, guys. So you know, check it out. You know, see if you can subscribe to that channel. Have a look at the videos because I'll be asking you some questions in those videos too as well, guys. Okay, so check that out too when you get a chance. There will be some videos up there for you tomorrow to have a look at too, guys. And just to get everyone sort of talking to each other and creating a much more sense of community you'll be able to talk to each other students from all over the world here of course maybe get a conversation going as well guys so have a look at that too tomorrow there'll be more videos up there for you tomorrow and again before we go on the Q&A for anybody leaving now don't forget we do value your feedback please rate this lesson when you leave the webinar okay you're rating the lesson on the content on delivery um, so like technical issues if you're having any does not come into it so you're actually rating myself uh, the content tonight that I delivered to you and how I delivered it anybody spot how I'm using sort of mass on my slide there at the moment <laughs> So it is, it's basically, so five if you really enjoyed it, and all the way down to one then if you didn't guys as well guys, okay, so I appreciate that, so if you enjoyed tonight's lesson, really much would appreciate a five, it makes me look good over here, and as I said guys, but like you know, we are improving lesson on lesson too guys, so I do appreciate that too as well, uh, Bassi is saying it's a six today, okay, thanks very much Bassi, appreciate it, by the way guys, yeah, just to make where you will be prompted once you leave the webinar, you don't need to type it into question boxes, you'll be prompted once you leave the webinar, okay guys, I think that is it for now, so we have a quick question and answer session now, I'm going to take a sip of water before we continue though, and I'll be back to you in just a minute, thank you. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, Kristen is asking, Hi Kevin, great lesson. Will we be having practical assignments, i.e. creating something on Friday? If your first uh, one will be creating your image composite, Kristen. So yeah, you will be creating a poster. I will supply you with some images for creating your composites, but I do encourage you, and these will be in your resources section in your student login area, but I do encourage you to use your own images too as well, Kirsten. So they, now don't get me wrong, these will not be graded. These are just for your, for your own practice as well, okay? Now, um, thanks for great classes, Alexander, no problem. Just give me a second, guys, my, my, my question box. There's lots of questions coming through, so I just need a second to rearrange it here so I can try and get to everybody if I can. Um, Ahmed is asking, what is the R sign near some logos? Um, okay, that basically means that it, it is registered. Okay, it is a registered brand, Ahmed. You will see logos with both TM sometimes. This means it's trademarked and they are going for registration. So, so it means basically that other people, you know, it, you're letting people know that your brand is trademarked. But once it's actually registered, then you will see them switching to the R. It just means the brand is then registered, okay, and people cannot use it without your consent. All right. Uh, Rachel Mercy is asking a very interesting question. Why is blue for boys? Well, Rachel, believe it or not, it actually used to be the other way around. It used to be pink for girls and blue for boys. And there's, uh, there's a huge explanation to that. The blue and pink thing only came about actually um, around World War II, I think, to be honest with you. It was even that soon. But it was initially the other way around because if you think of it, um, for example, in spirituality, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, is always seeing as wearing blue. And Jesus, on the other hand, was seeing as wearing sort of reddish, sort of off, or, or sort of, you know, off, off red, sort of off pink sort of clothes. So that's why it initially came about and then it was actually reversed. And if you, I will give a fuller answer we do, but even if you Google that, it's quite an interesting story as well. But it, it goes on for quite a while. Okay. Um, will this webinar be uploaded online? This webinar will be uploaded tomorrow uh, in your student login area as well, okay? Uh, um, people ask about submitting artwork, guys. Okay, if you use the hashtag Shaw Graphic, guys, do, I do encourage you to share your designs, share your composites online. Um, unfortunately, I personally will not be able to get through all of them myself. There's, I'm, I've simply, there's only one of me here, I'm afraid. But do share them on our social media with the hashtag Shaw Graphic. That is hashtag Shaw Graphic, guys. Okay, I'm actually going to send that to you all now, so you'll have it. So on our either on our Facebook or Twitter or whatever you like, guys. And again, it just encourages more participation with you guys, okay? Now, okay, just a second now. Dennis is asking me, how long have you been in this business? Okay, longer than I care to remember, Dennis. I have been designing now for about 20-odd years or so, Dennis. Okay, it's around 20 years or so experience behind me, okay? <laughs> now, 
just a second as well. And Jeremiah is just making the statement, would we be able to share what we do with the composite with other class members? Yeah, I just shared with you the hashtag Shaw Graphic or hashtag Shaw Graphic Design, either or if you want to use both you will be able to see what each other is doing too. So I do encourage you to share those on our Facebook and our Twitter pages, guys, okay? Um, just a second now as well. Philip is asking me a question about your assignments. He's saying, are the questions in the multiple choice exams at the end of the diploma along the lines of what is wrong with this logo or what are the different types of lines? Okay, Philip, yeah, no, they will be, you, they will be multiple choice questions. So you're in your final diploma exam, you'll have 100 multiple choice questions, A, B, C, D, are true or false. No, they, they, they will be very transparent, Philip, so they, they will either be right or wrong, so there won't be areas of goes what is wrong, for example. I'll be asking you to name the correct terms and things like that Philip as well so so like I said it'll be very transparent okay otherwise it could be we could get into a little bit of trouble over that um, is the final exam timed once you start your final exam at the end of the at the end of this course jury you will have two hours to complete it so you'll have two hours to complete your final exam once you start it okay just a second now as well uh, Premi is asking for the poster should we use Illustrator or Photoshop to be honest Premi whatever you're comfortable with okay I'm I'm concentrating more on Photoshop for that lesson we're covering Illustrator in lesson 5 and 6 so you can work in Photoshop for now and you will be using Photoshop for your image composites as well so when you're compositing your images together you will be using Photoshop of course okay uh, just a second now uh, da -da 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 -da. Tashana is asking, will there be practical exercises as part of the exam? No, there will not be practical exercises. It is a multiple choice questionnaire, Tashana, okay? Just a second now as well. Um, Widan says, thank you, Kevin. Enjoyed the lesson. I'm glad you did as well. Uh, Isha, Isha, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, is saying, is it a stressful job being a graphic designer? <laughs> it's like any job, I guess. But, you know, it can be stressful. You can be working with tight deadlines. You can be working with sort of tricky clients. But the more knowledge you have, just like, for example, today's class, the more knowledge you have and the better you are you're able to explain your designs and explain your decisions, this should take some of the stress out of it. But like any job, of course, it gets stressful at times, but it's very rewarding. It's very, very rewarding. I love nothing more than maybe, for example, I do a lot of album covers and things like that for musicians. I love nothing more than holding the physical piece then in your hands at the end. You've created something from nothing. So it is very, very rewarding. Now, just a second. Um, Leanne, or Lee Jean, excuse me, is asking, lesson three is pre-recorded what time can we listen to it it will be made available for you leanne on friday so around lunchtime on friday and then you'll be able to watch it um anytime you want then so anytime you want over the weekend or from friday on leanne you'll be able to you'll be able to listen to anytime after that okay um just a second now uh shabib is asking we need to know the good fonts and how, and how to move more not quite getting the question. We will be looking at typography uh, in Lesson 7, so we'll be looking at fonts in Lesson 7 too as well. Okay. Christopher Ells is asking, where do you download your graphic elements from other than the Adobe market? Okay. Um, if you look at your, at your graphic design starter pack i've included some links in that for you so you can download free elements you can of course get paid for elements then as well uh, so there's things like shutterstock but like image or um splash or sorry unsplash.com just going to send that to everybody now as well is a very good image resource and also dryicons.com is quite good for vectors and things like that. So I'm going to just send that to everybody out there right now. So that's unsplash.com and dryicons.com is quite good. But there's tons of them out there. There's loads of them out there. Okay. Now, just a second now. Will you teach us the side of printing in graphic design? We do go through printing techniques, uh, Mary is asking. We do go through printing techniques and how to set up documents for print, for professional print in lesson 10, Mary, yeah. So I will be going through uh, how to set up for print as well, Mary, okay? And the different printing techniques that we also use, all right? Okay, just a second now. 
Rena, Renan, Renan is asking, would you say it is very necessary to go study or, ra or, or rather start working right away? I think build up your knowledge first, Renan, and that's where you're here. Once you understand and once you study a little bit, you can obviously practice in your own time and start working, but the, you know, the more you understand about it, the easier it is. You will find the design process becoming easier. It's like anything, the more knowledge you have before you begin, the process is easier. It is simple as that, and you won't get as frustrated, I suppose, further on down the line as well. Okay. Uh, Chantal is saying, I think as an artist to use these principles without realizing it. That is true. That is true, Chantal. But the thing is with these principles, these are skills that you can learn. So you're sort of separating it. You, while there's always an artistic element in design, of course, um, understanding these, we can then apply. Now, some people do them automatically. They're just that way inclined, as simple as that. But even for non-designers, you can learn the skill of design as opposed to like maybe a, a more natural artistic flair, okay? Uh, just a second now. Okay, sorry guys, my question box is going a little bit nuts here, so just give me one second. Uh, just a second now. Um, Faraz is asking, I see assignment one is available. Okay guys, it is available, but I would, you, you will need to watch the three lessons first before you complete assignment one, guys, because there'll be questions on the three lessons. The assignments are weekly assignments. They're not based on each lesson. They're based on the lessons for that week, all right? Okay, just a second now as well. Um, and Annika is asking, where can I find the free starter pack? If you log into your student area and click on the toolkits, you will see um, you will see your graphic design starter pack. By the way, if you go over to the right hand of your screen, sometimes people and click the little arrow on the right hand of the screen, there'll be a little arrow. You click down and you will find them in there. Okay, and this will be this will be the same place that if you purchase your toolkits, uh, the same place that you find your webinar notes, your bonus video, and your webinar slides and things like that as well, guys. Okay. Salomon is asking what advanced course is covered. Basically, Salomon, the advanced course is aimed at building on the foundation course. This is a foundation, sort of a what is course. In the advanced course, we go into much, much more detail with all of the applications and sort of like professional design. Then we just examine everything in more detail because this is just a foundation course, just a few weeks. Our advanced course is actually over um, three months. It's over 12 weeks, okay? Uh, there's a second now. Thanks for the great lesson, says Cormac. You're welcome, Cormac. Good to see you again. See you soon. Um, just a second now. Do Allah is asking, do you think colour can inspire us? It can, of course, depending on the colour, Allah, all right? And depending, we need to understand colour to get our messages across. So it's all about messaging and using the correct colour as well, okay? To, to emphasise that messaging too, okay? Okay, just a second now as well. I love this lesson, says Nawal. Thanks very much. You're more than welcome. Um, Stephanie is asking how many lessons are in the advanced course. Stephanie, the advanced course runs over over 12 weeks, so two lessons per week over 12 weeks, Stephanie. Okay. Um, same instructor in the advanced course. It is indeed Edita. It is myself. Okay. Uh, Rebecca Delaney says that was a very interesting lesson thanks a million guys okay guys I think that is nearly it if I did miss any questions like I said there's lots of people uh, lots of lots of you guys out here today so please send through um, if I'd missed any questions send through to our graphic dot design address you see on your screens in front of you uh, Gustina is asking will you cover infographics I do in the advanced course Gustina but it's more of an advanced topic okay so in our advanced course we do look at infographics actually next week I think um, but we won't be covering the foundation course because, as I said, this is essentially more about the, the, the fundamentals. It's the foundation of design, okay? Okay. Um, do we need to have Photoshop? For lesson three and four, is see, we will be using Photoshop. Yes. Okay. Damien says, very cool lesson. Thank you. Indeed. Okay. Thanks, only Damien. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. Like I said... Thanks very much. I'll see you back here. So lesson three, your, on, your first of your on-demand lessons will be available for you Friday. I do encourage you to have a look at that. Please post your um, post, post your, your artwork with the hashtag Shaw Graphic or hashtag Shaw Graphic Design. Either or, or both, all the better. And I will see you back here next week where we'll be looking at photo editing. So we're going to be looking using Photoshop and looking at photo editing, learning how to, for example, airbrush ourselves or models or things like that. And also just basically making our images more 
more vibrant and making them look basically better guys okay so if you've got any summer summer photos or beach photos or maybe you want to airbrush your your you know your your tinder profile something like that i'll teach you how to do all of that guys okay so it should be a very very interesting lesson too and thanks a million guys don't forget as i said please rate the lesson once you leave the webinar a big high five i'd appreciate it and i will see you all as i said back here next week guys so thanks a million for everything if i did miss anything please uh, send me through to the email graphic.design at show academy and for now this is kevin and jeremiah is right i am designing off bye bye guys